So we're going to continue our discussion of Euler's formula in the plane, and we're going to put it to work. Right, so the main topic here, we're going to talk about maximal planar graphs. A graph is a maximal planar graph if it's planar. And if I add any edge, okay, so this is a weird way of writing. There's a, some pair of vertices that's not already an edge, and if I add that to the graph, then this is going to be not planar. Right, so I'm really defining what it means for the planar graph to be maximal. Can't add any more edges. If you try to add any more edges, it will not be planar anymore. So we can't add any edges. I guess I should put and keep it planar. You can always add more edges. And, well, if it's not a complete graph, you can add more edges, but it might not be planar anymore. All right. So, what is interesting about maximal planar graphs? Well, they're going to give us a lot of leverage for making kind of the extreme statements about what are the most edges we can put in a planar graph. Now, I'm going to use this other word, which is going to be mostly equivalent. The lemma is going to seem like it's equivalent, but it's a different kind of thing. So, here it is. Let's be careful with it. A triangulation. It's going to be an embedding of a planar graph in which every face is bounded by three edges, right? This is three embedded edges. So every face looks like a triangle. That means there's three vertices and three paths like this. Um, I should be careful about this. So one time I was teaching a class and uh, I asked a question. We were talking about planar graphs and embeddings of planar graphs. And um, I asked a question about triangles. And um, Students started answering, and then another student tried to answer, and there was a lot of confusion. And finally, a student said, said, wait a minute, what's a triangle? And I felt like this is the real culmination of your you know, great educational experience is when you get so confused that now you've forgotten what a triangle is. Um, but it's true that we do use the word triangle in a lot of different ways. Uh, intuitively, you think, well, a triangle is a geometric object. And from like Euclid's Elements Book 1, you should know all about triangles. But, on the other hand, K3 also seems like a triangle, three vertices, three edges, but it's a purely combinatorial object. Then if you take an embedding of K3 in the plane, that seems like it should also be considered a triangle, um, in which case it's only kind of topologically a triangle. Um, so when I talk about triangles in the embedding here, I do mean the embedding of K3 in the plane. So the edges don't have to be straight, they just have to be continuous paths. All right. Now, um, if I have an embedding of a planar graph where all the phases are triangles, we're going to call that a triangulation. And um, this is going to be more or less equivalent to being maximal, right? So uh, remember, maximal is a notion for graphs. Triangulation is a notion for the embeddings of those graphs. Um, but the following lemma kind of connects them. So if you have any, really every embedding of a maximal planar graph is a triangulation. The converse of this is true as well, like if an embedding of a graph is a triangulation, then it's maximal, but I'll leave that as an exercise. I'm going to need a finer pen to fit this, this proof into this small space here. The idea is, suppose you had some embedding of some maximal planar graph, and some face of that graph had four or more vertices. Right, that is, some face is not a triangle. Uh, well, what, what do we know then? In that case, the four vertices on that face, let's draw a picture of it. So there's some cycle here. It's got four vertices on it. It might not even be a cycle, but they're somehow all on the, the same face. These four vertices must all be pairwise connected. So there, for any pair of these, these vertices, there has to be an edge there already. And the what reason that's true is that if there wasn't one, I could add it because since they're connected across the face. And so if I can add an edge across the face without crossing anything else that connects two vertices, then it must not have been maximal. But we assumed it was maximal, so those edges must have already been present which means that uh, um, we have a K4 subgraph. 
But this is a bit strange because if I have a K4 subgraph, then the four vertices can't all be on the same face because then that would imply that K4 is outer planar. So I should maybe add this K4 subgraph with all vertices on one face. So if I took the embedding and I just take this, the subset of the embedding where these, this K4 got embedded, then uh, I would get an embedding of K4 with all the vertices on one face. And we saw that that's not possible. So that would imply K4 is outer planar, uh, which is a contradiction. Okay, so, so that from that we conclude that actually there is going to be no such embedding and that every embedding of a planar, of a maximal planar graph really has to be a triangulation. And so that, that gives us this connection between maximal planar graphs and what the faces look like. The faces are all triangles. All right, so there's some triangulations here. Some of the, these are the three classic triangulations. Uh, you may recognize them. Uh, this is the graph of the tetrahedron. This is the octahedron, octohedron. And this is the icosahedron. In fact, um, I just point these out uh, as nice examples because, you know, these, in, these were the original examples for Euler's formula. This, along with the other two platonic solids, the cube and the dodecahedron, because the original setting for Euler's formula was really about polyhedra in 3D. And we're going to talk a lot about polyhedra in, later in the course. And you might want to think a little bit about how to connect uh, three-dimensional solids that are made up of faces and planar graphs and how you can go between them. All right, but for now, uh, let's see finally the main event here. We're going to use Euler's formula in the plane to prove something concrete that is a bound on the number of vertices and the number of faces that can show up in a planar graph. And I've left blanks here, as I do with these notes, and usually you can imagine I would just fill in a blank here and fill in the blank here. Then we'd know what the heck we were trying to prove. Um, but actually, this is kind of a good chance to see a technique for not just uh, mathematical proof, but maybe mathematical discovery, because you'll find that this happens a lot, where you can start proving something before you knew what the heck it is you were trying to prove. You can imagine if you kind of knew the technique you were going to try, you can just try it, get to the end, find out what you proved, and then just write it in. And that may seem terrible if you have a kind of a purist idea about, about math in terms of the total order in which things happen. That is, I state something and then I prove it, which is the way it appears in a book, and it's the way it ought to appear in a book. But it's not the way you would necessarily discover it on your own. So for instance, we could have written this as an exercise, which is, what are the most number of edges in a planar graph? What's the most number of faces you can have in a planar graph, let's say with n vertices? Then, uh, then you would work through it and just write an answer in the end. But I've written it as a theorem, uh, and so for now I'm going to go through the proof, and then we'll figure out what the heck we proved only afterward. So here's the idea. I'm going to claim that first it's going to suffice to prove a bound for a maximal planar graph that is on the same vertex set. So I've got uh, Vg equals Vg prime, and uh, G is a subset of G prime. It's a subgraph. Okay, so the same, same number of vertices. I just increased the number of edges and possibly increased the number of faces. Now, we know in the case for maximal planar graphs, all the faces are going to be triangles. That was our main theorem we just proved. So if I look at F prime with number of faces in any embedding of this uh, graph G prime, this is going to be, um, well, let's see, since they're all triangles, I'm going to have three edges per face. But every edge gets then counted twice. So I think I should get two 
uh, m prime over 3. The other way to do this would be the other way around, which is to try to count the number of edges in terms of the number of faces, and you would see that each edge gets counted by two faces. It counts for one third of each face. All right, so let's plug this in and see if it works. All right, so I want to claim, I want to put a bound on m, right? So we said that m was less than or equal to m prime, which is equal to, by Euler's formula, if we rearrange Euler's formula right, we get n plus f prime minus 2. Okay, that's me just taking the m and moving it over and the 2 moving it to the other side. And this gives me, uh, this is equal to, if I plug this in, that's n plus 2 thirds m prime minus 2. Okay, now if I look at just this part of the equation, I've got m prime is equal to 2 n plus 2 thirds m prime minus 2. So if I subtracted this from both sides and then multiply by 3 halves, what do I get? I get, uh, or actually I multiply by 3 because I'll end up with 1 third m prime over here. And uh, so I multiply by 3 and I get 3 n minus 6. All right, so I'm going to put that in as my bound, 3 n minus 6. What's neat here is that you'll notice the after I switch to the maximal planar graph, these are equal signs. So I know that this bound is tight. Like I'm not going to be able to find a smaller bound that works for all planar graphs because for maximal planar graphs, there are in fact exactly this many edges. I could do the same thing for faces. Euler's formula in this case, right, the number of faces is 2 minus n plus m prime, which is equal to 2 minus n minus uh, 3 halves f prime. And I do the same trick, right, I'm going to add 3 halves. Oh, I think I, my signs are wrong here. Is there something funny about this? Let's see, plus m prime. This should have been plus 3 halves. Ooh, good. So this, I'm going to subtract 3 halves f prime from both sides. I'll end up with a negative 1 half f prime on the other side. Multiply the whole thing by negative 2, and I get 2n minus 4, 2n minus 4. Again, it's all equal signs once I'm working with the maximal planar graph. So it's actually realized for in the case of maximal planar graphs. And we could just do a quick sanity check that we in fact did this. Let's just look at the tetrahedron. The tetrahedron had n equals 4, m equals 6, and f equals 4, right? So this is in fact equal to 3 times n minus 6, 3 times n is 12 minus 6, and this is in fact equal to 2n minus 4, because 2 times n is 8, minus 4 is 4. So that one works. The octahedron has n equals 6, m equals, ooh, I gotta count them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and f equaled 8, that's the 8 for oct. And we can check again that this is 3 times 6 minus 6, and this is 2 times 6 minus 4, okay? And uh, you can do it yourself for the octahedron. I'll leave that as an exercise. But it's just a quick sanity check that these really are the right um, formulas. We expect to see that not only are these upper bounds, but these are tight upper bounds that are, are realized in the case of maximal planar graphs or when the embedding is a triangulation. So the key takeaways is that for planar graphs, you're going to have less than 3n edges and less than 2n faces.